We are in this really quick little mini series. Uh, started last week, um, we'll do it this week and the next week on Palm Sunday. Uh, talking about this kind of divided church idea and uh, how within the church context, there's been a lot of division for a lot of different reasons. And I'm gonna talk about a lot about those reasons uh, here this morning. But uh, last week we talked about the difference between pride and humility. And I'm not gonna go into all of that today, but I will say at the end of this, I, I, I do wanna reference what it means to cultivate humility personally and communally. Um, that'll be at the end of this message. But we talked a lot about pride uh, last week and what that does and how it causes so much division uh, personally uh, in our relationships and then uh, in our relationship with God and with others. Uh, and then, you know, just kind of think kind of communally uh, together what can transpire and the reasons behind that and what we ultimately want is this idea of unity. Uh, we want, uh, it's what God desires for us, that uh, we want this wholeness and this holiness to our lives and to be in right relationship and understanding of who I am uh, with God and who I am uh, with others. That's the essence of uh, humility. Um, Jesus actually taught this uh, of his desire for us um, uh, to be unified. And, and I wanted to say this uh, right off the top that, that unity can't be mandated. Uh, it is chosen. Uh, it, it is chosen. We cannot, I can't just say to us, uh, we are now unified. And it's done. Like, that's not how this works. It, we have to choose to be unified. And when I say unified, uh, I don't mean um, that we're all the same. Uh, unity is not uniformity. It, it's, it's understanding this appreciation of diversity, diversity in thought. Uh, one of the sayings that we've had here at our church uh, for a while now is we want diversity in thought, not division in community. And uh, to, to try and make that as a reality of who we are, and it takes humble people to make that happen. Uh, that's not easy. You guys know that, right? Do you guys, do you love when you're in conversation with someone you just adamantly disagree with? It's, it's difficult. It's, it's difficult, um, but humble people can still love one another in those times and so, and be in community together in, in spite of a difference of opinion. So I'm not talking about all of us thinking the exact same way. Um, I am saying that we have unity and we have unity in one name. And what is that one name? Jesus. Yeah, we just sang about it in that powerful way that Natalie just did. And, and uh, that's going to be kind of like a anthem song for us these next few weeks, even heading through Easter, is this idea of just this one name of Jesus. We are unified on this one name of Jesus. When Jesus was talking uh, to some people uh, towards the end of his life, he had this prayer, and this prayer is pretty cool because it includes all of us. He, this is Jesus speaking. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray uh, that uh, for those who will be, believe in me through their message, that all of them may be what? One, right? One right there. Uh, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That Jesus is praying as my people who say that they're followers of me and Christians, like as they're unified, then the world will start to see and believe that he's true. I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be as one as we are uh, one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So this calling, so if you're not a Christian in here, I, I, it's great, I'm glad you're here and uh, you're trying to figure out your faith and, and everything else. And, but I want you to see, one, how much God loves you. Uh, two, the responsibility of the Christian people that you know to show you how much God loves you. So if you're a Christian in here, like there's this responsibility of unity that through our unity and how we are together in a diversified community that those who don't know Jesus will look at a grouping of Christians in diversified community and say, hmm, that whole thing is real. Oh, wow, like he must love us because you don't see this anywhere else. You don't see people acting like this and being generous to one another, being gracious and kind and loving to one another like you would see with a grouping of Christians. There's something so particular about that. We also talked about last week how Paul talks about Romans 12, how to don't conform to the patterns of this world, that there's a way that this world works. And uh, it's not the world in creation or the people in the world per se, but that there's something else going on in the way the world works. There's a spirit behind uh, this world. And I love what Jesus says in John chapter 8, 44. He's talking about Satan and how he works in this world. And it says this, he says, when he what? He speaks his native tongue, for he is a what? And the father of what? So, um, you know, we've said this before, but 
we don't like to talk this way, and, and I get it, and there's a reason, but like when we lie, how many guys have lied? Yeah, yeah. Um, you, we are not being like Jesus when we lie, correct? <laughs> Who are we being like? Satan, just say it, right? Satan, right? Like it's like, it's like something that's coming out in us, and, and, we get, and listen, I, I, I know that feels like daunting to say, but, but what the Bible is like pointing us towards in, in the midst of like understanding what lying does to us is it, it fractures everything, it breaks trust. It brings suspicion to all of our relationships. We, we can't be genuinely who we are. You can't be vulnerable. And it breaks community. And we start seeing the lies that are in. And the father of lies is, is Satan. There's something here of what Satan does with lies that really impacts our unity. It impacts our humility. It impacts how we see ourselves uh, with God and with others. Uh, in 1 John uh, 5, 19, it says this, We know that we are children of God meaning those that follow Jesus, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So there's something about the spirit of the world that's, that's out there. And uh, the lie of the world is, 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 is trying to get us to believe these other lies. It's like, no, 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 we got to recenter ourselves on the reality and the truth of Jesus. Now, here's what's kind of cool about all of this. When all these authors in the Bible, uh, one of the ways that they talk about this is that we can learn and grow in wisdom and understand how the devil works. And so um, when Paul in 2 Corinthians, this guy named Paul, he, he wrote this letter to the early church in Corinth. And in this letter, he's talking to this community and he's like, hey, I get it. Some things got fractured and got divisive. And, and, and if you forgive someone, I'll forgive someone. And we just got to, we got to kind of be unified in how we're approaching one another and, and loving one another. And, and at one point in the letter, he, he actually says this to them. He says, uh, as we forgive one another and begin to understand and stay unified in community, we do this in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we're not unaware of his schemes. So it's like, you can, we don't have to be duped. You don't have to believe the lies. Like you, we can be very aware of how this all works if we begin to understand how to discern the lies that are in front of us and move us towards uh, unity. And that can only happen and cultivate it through community. Peter, who is another one of the followers of Jesus and super close to him, uh, he said it this way, which I love. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to what? He's not trying to buddy up to us. So these lies we believe. So if you think about this, like we've all believed lies about ourselves at some point in time. And those lies that we start to believe aren't uh, to just make us a little bit worse. The idea is to devour, to take control of, to totally divert in a, in a different direction of how you're supposed to be and how we're supposed to think. And so... Um, when I was thinking this week about this divided element of the church and, and cultivating humility and, and, and how do we gather around this idea of uh, unity, we need to be better at discerning lies. And one of the uh, guys that Lacey and I have read it was talking about parenting, and we've done this with our kids a little bit here and there. Uh, but uh, one of the things he did with his kids growing up all the time, he would watch movies with them, and he would play this game, and he would say, all right, let's play discern the lie. And so you can watch a Disney movie, and it's like, all right, let's, let's discern the lie of what this movie is, is telling us. And uh, it was training his kids to see things differently. Training his kids to be able to look at what was being presented in a story and be like, hold on a second, that's not true. That, that's a lie. And it's an important skill set to begin to develop in us, but it's not, uh, it's not easy because we can all get cloudy vision. Uh, it's not easy because maybe we weren't trained to discern the lie. But it's an important skill to, to begin to understand because if we can understand his schemes and the way that lies begin to work, then we can center ourselves in the reality and the truth of Jesus and not have to sway back and forth all the time. And so this idea of discerning the lie will actually bring uh, unity uh, into us. So if the desire of unity uh, for those that are Christians is there and the, the desire that Jesus uh, wants uh, for us is unity, um, then what's the problem? And what's the problem? Can, can you look at the person next to you and just go ahead and look at them and just say this? You are. <laughs> yeah. And... Look at the other person, look at the other person, look at them that you didn't look at and say, don't kid yourself, you are too. Okay? So, 
we're all a part of this problem. We're our, we're our, we, we play a part in this, this division that begins to happen in different ways. And so what I want to do today is that I want to lay out some of the kind of cultural ways that might be helpful and help us start learning how to discern the lies that we see before us. And, uh, and then uh, I'm going to wrap it up with, with talking about how we kind of cultivate this uh, humble disposition in the midst of this. And so here are some things of like what happens, uh, or what the problem is. One, people are complicated. Uh, you're complicated. I'm complicated. Uh, you can't tell uh, uh, the depth and breadth of a person simply by one action or decision that they make. Thank God. Thank God. Every person in this room has been an idiot at some point. <laughs> thank God you weren't defined by that. You might have had consequences for those actions, but thank God you were not defined by that. Because we're complicated. You think about even in the Bible, um, Moses, uh, who uh, most people know about Moses and the Ten Commandments and how God used him. He was also a murderer. It's complicated. David, King David. How many of you guys know who David is in the Bible, right? Maybe you know the story about David and Goliath and everything. It's like, oh, King David, he's so great and everything else. David, I wouldn't let him do anything in our church. <laughs> like anything. That dude is a nightmare. You know, like, and so... He sure as heck wouldn't be around any of the singles. And so, but like, so, so David, but yet, man, he, David's propped up in this like incredible way, but it, it's, it's complicated. And so if you, if you go through and you kind of think through history, all of these different people, it's like we celebrate people and we make statues of people, but they're complicated. And it's tough to like, to just center in on some of this. And so that's why things get so divisive so quickly is because we try making it so simplistic, but we're just not. We're, we're, we're complicated people. Um, you know, like uh, Ab Abraham Lincoln, like we, we, we put him up on a pedestal, but like he was a complicated person. It wasn't all perfect. Martin Luther King, wonderful, one, but he was complicated. And so we start seeing that people are complicated and that becomes a problem. The second thing is that we overvalue sameness. We overvalue sameness. Uh, when you think about sameness, we like to be around people who think like us and act like us. And in really bad scenarios, that like look like us, right? And so that's how one of the reasons that uh, this racial disparity happens in so many different ways. But we overvalue uh, sameness. And, and to some degree, you begin to understand why sameness feels good. Um, sameness in the Bible is, is looked at very poorly, it's, it's not, um, diversity is always amplified in the Bible. Sameness, if you want to know what God does with sameness, look at the story in the Tower of Babel in Genesis. He's like, nope, not doing that. I'm spreading you guys all out. So it's about diversity. It's about uh, uh, the appreciation of one another. It's about someday when we all talk about wanting to be in eternity together uh, in, in heaven to understand it is going to be incredibly diverse. And so to have a, a sameness in a grouping of people within the church uh, is not biblical. Now I get it. There are some places in uh, America where the town is one specific race and so, or heavily one, one race and it's like it's going to look a certain way. And I, and I understand that. We don't live in that space. And so for us, it's like, no, we, we need to continue to get more diverse, continue to represent more countries, continue to have different elements of our, our community that are diverse. Like that, why? Because it models the reality and the truth of the kingdom of God. And they overvalue sameness. A third thing that starts to happen is this, um, Christians love to play this game, find the enemy. Find the enemy. Uh, it's interesting because Jesus says to, to love the enemy, but Christianity is for so, so many for so many reasons and so, so many times, and, uh, and non-Christians are now doing this at a larger level too, but uh, Christians have done this quite well of saying, we're going to find the enemy, we need to take them down. When Jesus was like, no, we need to love the enemy. And it goes against what Jesus actually taught. And so we begin to see like, this idea of finding the enemy. Let me show you some examples of how this works. And this is an example. In 1925, the Scopes trial against evolution. Williams Jang Bryant was, was kind of the person representing the fundamentalist Christianity side. And, uh, and so they were, he was like a well-known orator and lawyer. And, and so uh, what, what transpired here was this fight, this fight against science. And then Christians took up this stance against science. And, and here was the lie that happened in this moment. And then it kept building on itself over time. Prior to this, primarily 
uh, Christianity and science like work together. A lot of scientists were Christians and they saw the beauty of God and, 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 and everything. And uh, right around this point, this became the precursor to a lot of fights around Christianity and science and that they can't coexist. That is a lie. Like faith in Jesus can coexist with science. It can. The lie is, is that you have to fight against it all the time. The lie is, is you know, like when people like, like, maybe the, word, the earth wasn't 6,000 years old. And they're like, oh my gosh. How could you ever say something like this? Like, you know, you heretic. It's like, I mean, it's possible. And science like points to certain things and it's like, it doesn't have to like all of a sudden dismantle the Bible or dismantle our faith. It's like they can coexist, but the lie is, is that they can't and it creates a lot of division and, and it did within the community. Another example is this, uh, the moral majority. Um, so the guy uh, on uh, your left there is uh, Jerry Falwell um, who started Liberty University. And uh, he and a guy named Bob Jones, uh, he, he had Bob Jones University um, and some others started this um, organization called the Moral Majority in the 1970s. Uh, they were complicated people. Was the entire movement bad? No. There were some good things that were, they were trying to like center on in the midst of it. Were there some bad things? Yes. As an example, the, the movement started because they wanted to keep, uh, uh, they wanted the ability to make the decision to not allow interracial dating on their campuses. And so Follow was a segregationist. Bob Jones was very racist, and uh, um, so they were fighting for this, and they were petitioning the government. They lost, and so then they kind of shifted into these other cultural things. So, so they, they, what they were trying to do, essentially, through all of this, and again, some of the stuff that they did were, were actually good and moral things, and some of it was truly awful. And so, but, but what happened in the midst of this, the lie that was created was this, that Christians need power. We don't. We don't. You know why we don't need power? Because we have who? Jesus. Jesus didn't have power in Rome. Somehow the church exploded. Granted, he died and rose again. That's pretty significant. But he didn't have power in the, 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 the sense that we see it in, in humanity. We, he didn't have it. So, so we don't need it. Now here's the thing. The lie is that we need to get in the power. The lie is that we need to get in certain places in government. That's, that's a lie. The truth is, is that we can go into some of those places, but the way that Christians interact with power is very different than those who are not Christians. So a Christian can be in a place of power, but how they interact with that power is very differently. And so the lie is that we need it. But the truth is, is that we can be in it, but we interact with it differently. Um, another example uh, is this. <laughs> this book was one of the best sellers in 1988. And... Uh, it actually came out with another one in 89. And um, <laughs> they did this at the end of the world was, was coming and like millions of books were sold on this. And, and part of this was like, how do we find the enemy? You know, Russia's doing this and Russia's still like the thing. But so, so it ends up in, in the find the enemy and all this other stuff. And they're, and they're trying to create this system of fear and thinking that fear will bring people to Jesus. That is a lie. Fear does not bring people to Jesus into a true interaction to follow Jesus. It's the submission and the, the loving into this, and it's the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. And so we see that, that part of the, the, the lie that was being cultivated is like, we need to find the enemy. It's, it's these types of people. It's this grouping of people. It's this country, whatever. And so they w would start things like this. And, you know, sometimes they did it with music. If you grew up in the 80s or 90s, you remember um, how often they would do it with music. Um, if you guys, did anyone grow up with when you played music backwards? Anyone remember this? Oh, Wow. Um, you know, they would do, I don't know if you guys know this, but what they would do is, um, uh, I think it was Another One Bites the Dust was the song. And uh, if you played it backwards, they would be like, listen. And like, you know, and they, they would play this and they're like, do you hear that? It says it's fun to smoke marijuana. And it's like, that's and they're like, it does say that. You know, it, does, it doesn't really. But like, but that was like, they're always trying to create like all these different um, enemies all the time. And so it was just what was the, kind of the playbook. And that playbook kind of continued on um, uh, one after another. The fourth thing is this, cultural anxiety. Cultural anxiety. Um, what's interesting is there's always been a level of culture. We, we, every grouping of people has like an, an anxious nature to like how things are, okay? What's fascinating is that, um, there's this one book in 1957 um, called On the Road. 
And uh, a, a lot of people point back to this book as it was written uh, as something that was like really significant in how people started seeing culture differently. Uh, the lie that was told through this was that, uh, that you, can, um, you just need to be an explorer. Um, the idea of like, I need to go out west. Um, this is part, like this book like talks a lot about that. Um, this idea to um, really, uh, it's about self-exploration and kind of like centered on the self. This, this really started um, enabling people uh, um, to become disconnected from community. This idea of like, if you just got to go explore and disconnect yourself and you'll find yourself eventually. And so uh, this started this transient nature of thinking and seeing as many things as you could. And, and this started like fracturing the reality of why community was so important. Um, this is one of the reasons, not the whole reason, but this is one of the things that happened. So um, this guy, Mark Sayers, talks a lot about this um, in, in a lot of his books, but he does something really interesting. He was talking about cultural anxiety. So let's just say, oops, I don't know what happened there. Um, if we've got cultural anxiety up here, up top here, Sorry, what's happening? <laughs> My pen was not responding. That makes me anxious, what that looks like. And so he was saying this. So you have cultural anxiety, and then you have these pillars of things. So you have like the church, let's say here. Um, you've got the government, and let's say you've got school. All right, so you've got education. And uh, so these things that carry the weight of the culture, and that those things are, or these institutions were in place to just carry all of that. And, uh, and so communally, you could, essentially, you would want to trust the church. Uh, you would want to trust the government, that they had, they were, that um, the reason why there were multiple parties in the government was so there was a diverse thought and they could handle the cultural weight of things. Um, they would want to trust the school system and the education system so they could handle uh, the weight of things. So what actually ended up started happening was as the lack of uh, trust in institutions started to rise because we're so self-centered, and so, um, like, if I was like, hey, how many guys trust the government right now? My guess is there's not a lot of hands would go up in this room. How many guys trust the education system? There'd probably be a few of you guys, and you're probably really good teachers. <laughs> um, so, like, how many guys trust the church? And I hope you guys would say, we trust ours. Um, but if you kind of ask people outside of it, there's a lack of trust in the church. And so what ended up happening is institutions started uh, uh, fracturing. And then you go into more like a, of like a network model. All right. And so the network model is you just, you're finding your people and it's global, right? And it's all connected in different ways. Um, but what happens is, is, let's just say this group here is your, your people. If you disagree with that network, what happens? You get kicked out. And then you got to find another network. And it creates these tribes and it creates all these different ways of thinking. And so this is what we're living in right now, this, this networked idea. This networked idea, this globalized idea. And are there some good to it? Sure, but there's a lie within all of it that you have to agree on everything, that you can't have a diversity uh, of thought. And so what ends up transpiring off of this is in this network model, you start seeing things like this. Cancel culture, lack of boundaries, division, disrespect, you're easily offended. Um, lack of biblical clarity on, on moral issues. And so that's what we start seeing in the network model. So these are all things that are the end result of this and that transpire. And this is why we get unified. Or, or this is why everything gets, uh, we, have, we have lack of unity within our community and understand Christians participate in all of this. And we've got to discern the lies within it. Another way uh, that this happened is a, a movement, from a movement to consumer cycle. Um, this happens in uh, churches and with Christians, and it has for a very long time. This is not anything uh, new. Um, this guy, he's scary. And uh, I thought maybe this was a fake picture. This is what he looks like. So this guy, is, his name is Charles Finney, and uh, he, he will haunt your dreams for the rest of your lives. But Charles Finney uh, was an unbelievably powerful evangelist. He was part of the abolitionist movement and did some incredible things for the gospel. And uh, in a time in the 1800s, and, and so what we saw um, during this, I'll give you an example of why Charles Finney is like such a big deal. Um, he, uh, if you grew up in church at all, um, how many of you guys ever heard of like an altar call? Okay. So Charles Finney was the one who kind of started this. Um, and he would talk about like this idea of, all right, an altar call was this. It wasn't that you were just making a decision just for yourself. Like, that's the lie. 
what he would say is, here's what this means. You're coming down to the altar, which would be typically the front. You'd have people praying with you. And in this moment, in, in this altar call, it was designed that you would make this commitment to follow Jesus, but understand that to follow Jesus is to be justice-oriented, and you would sign up for the abolitionist movement right then and there. It wasn't just this, ooh, I just raised my hand, or ooh, I just made a, I made a decision to follow Jesus today, and that counted for anything. That's not, he's like, no, that's not how this works. For you to actually get involved and to follow Jesus, you're going to be justice-oriented. And you're going to be action, like there's going to be action immediately that follows out of you. Not perfect. You got a lot of work to do in formation and discipleship and all those things. But man, you've got to be justice oriented. And so those people in the 1800s get this. If they made it, went down to the altar call and determined that they wanted to follow Jesus, they were fighting against racism and they were fighting for women's rights. Immediately. And so it changed. When it changes from a movement, a, a deep, passionate, uh, every movement of, of, of God in the church, it starts with a small grouping of people. They call it like a remnant. And the cycle is, is that the remnant in this generation of people gets so excited. And, and, and then they pass it on to the next generation. And if they're not really paying particular attention of how to pass it on, the next generation kind of waters it down a little bit. And then the generation after that waters it down a lot. And then the next thing you know, it's like, we need another remnant. And we're kind of, in, we're in that right now, actually, culturally. This, this kind of revival or awakening that's starting to happen. It's like they're looking for people to passionately follow Jesus, be justice-minded, justice-oriented, and, and what it means to actually engage. Martin Lloyd-Jones Martin Lloyd said this, which, which I just want to show you, like, not that long after Finney did all this stuff and all these really cool things were happening. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a, a preacher at the time, he, he says this. Never forget the pride and arrogance of the church in the 19th century. Like, hold on a second. They were just killing it for Jesus with the abolitionist movement. And Jones is like, no, behold her sitting back in self-satisfaction, enjoying her so-called cultural sermons and learned ministry. Observe the prosperous Victorian comfort uh, comfortably enjoying his worship. How constantly he denied the spirit of the New Testament. It happened so quickly to go from a movement to a consumer cycle. Um, some of you guys... Uh, might have grown up in this time, the Jesus movement. Um, and this is uh, a picture of what was, all these people getting baptized in California. Um, there was uh, a, a movie recently, The Jesus Revolution, which was like so good and uh, giving you just like a little window into what, what transpired in that and the complications of some of that movement uh, as well. But this happened, it was like this huge movement and this, this deep passion to follow Jesus and people getting baptized and like miraculous things happening. And it was this remnant of people that started and it started growing in like thousands of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people and eventually millions of people uh, come to know the reality and the truth of Jesus in the midst of this. But this happened at the same time the moral majority was happening. And so all of a sudden these lies started in interrupting each other. And what about power? And, all this, and it started to get complicated. And it moved uh, from this deep passionate movement to a consumeristic movement. Here's an example. This is the largest glass building in the world at one point. This was a church. And uh, this is the Crystal Cathedral. Anyone remember this? Like seeing it on TV and everything else. And so what's interesting is you might think like, what does this have to do with the church? A lot. This started a movement of how do you make it essentially dumb down the reality of Jesus in such a way to try and attract people and give them crumbs. Just get them in the building. And what it was was um, it was a mile long and an inch deep. And so when the lie was that you couldn't form, like formation wasn't important. The lie was that you just needed to attract people. The lie was that you could just kind of do whatever culture was doing with, with big bands and eventually big dramas and all these different things. It was, a, it was the lie that was created is if you could just get people attracted enough, it would work. The problem with that was you might get people in the building uh, to say they believe in Jesus, but when things got hard, there was no depth there to handle what was like, thrown at them in life. And so they divide or they leave. And it can't stay unified in the midst of all of it. And so this is what starts to happen. So where do we go? How do we stay unified and diversified then? And this is the same way that we cultivate humility from last week. So you can do this personally and we can do this communally. How do we stay unified and diversified? One, contentment. Contentment. And here's what I mean by that. Find the good. Be people who find the good. 
It's so easy to be negative. It's so easy to be critical. It's so easy to see someone and you're like, they're the worst. The Democrats are the worst. The Republicans are the worst. So-and-so is the worst. Whatever. It's so easy to do that. People are complicated. Find the good in one another. Find the good in one another. See the good in one another. Be content in your space. Be content in your time. Be content in your community. And see the good moments of everything. And the second thing there of commitment. God um, wants our faithfulness more than he wants our efficiency. We think with God that it's like, no, no, I want this and this and this and this and this, right? That's a lie. That's a lie. So many things if you, look, if you read the Bible, so many times God makes these promises. And sometimes it takes generations for those promises to come true. It's not on our timing. But man, when we, we understand it's about faithfulness, not efficiency, we are committed to stuff. Um, I was in a meeting a couple weeks ago and uh, the gentleman was sharing, uh, we were talking about some uh, justice work that we want to get into uh, as a church. And, and he was like, he goes, yeah, he's like talking about the NAACP. And he's like, listen, they were established in 1909. They didn't get Brown versus the Board of Education until 1954. It's like it takes time and faithfulness and commitment. And to commit to one another is also to commit to conflict. If you guys are, are, are married and you're committed to one another, you commit to conflict in resolving it. If you're, if you're in great friendships with one another, you're going to commit to conflict. Like that's what do, the committed relationships do to, to one another. That's how you love. That's how you, you grow. Right now, uh, you know, we're in this like interesting time frame where you have this collision of all the generations happening. You, you know, in work and, and, you know, it used to be like, I mean, decades ago, if you went into the workplace, there was like basically a certain generation that made all the decisions. So you walk in, you're like, oh, there's a 54-year-old, they make the decisions. You know, like that's how it worked. Um, now you go in and you're like, what is that 21-year-old doing? Why are they telling me how to run this? What are they, right? It's all these collisions of different things happening and people are working longer. And so you see all this stuff, but there's a commitment to community. There's a commitment to unity. There's a commitment here, and this is why we talk about it so much, to intergenerational relationships. You're committed to that. That brings unification and diversification of our community. And um, there's curiosity and, and courage in all of this. Um, we're always learning and we're always putting wisdom into action. Uh, one thing um, I want you guys to just remember is being curious is more important than being right. How many of you guys like to be right? I mean, we all do. We all do. But being curious is infinitely more important. Because it's your curiosity that brings unity. It's your curiosity that begins to explore. It's your curiosity that allows for diversity to happen. Sometimes even here at the church, um, uh, people won't like something that happens. The music is too loud or you preach too long or whatever. Uh, there's like things that can happen and, and, during it, and I get it. Um, here's what I always respond. If 75 to 80% of your needs are being met, it's great. Because in the other 20 to 25%, someone else's needs are being met. And that brings a, a compassionate, loving, unified community. If 100% of your needs are, are 100% met, that's good for you, but it's probably pretty bad for someone else. And it's going to be, everyone's got to be exactly like you. And so it's like, oh, we have a diversified community, a diversified way to begin to, to think about things. Because as we start like processing, we want that, we, we desire that, this, this unified nature of everything. So we're curious, we're learning, we're growing. And in the midst of that, we become unified. Um, I want to highlight two scripture passages to close. Paul says this in Ephesians 4. He says, we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. So we don't do this because we begin to discern the lie and so we can stay centered. We can stay focused on Jesus. We can stay where we're, we need to be and blown here and there by every wind and teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, let me pause there for just a quick second. It doesn't, uh, the, the word that's actually supposed to be there is Paul made up a word that's truthing in love 
a lot of times people will be like, yeah, we've got to speak the truth in love. And it's like, yeah, it's a part of it. What actually Paul is saying is truthing in love, meaning our full embodied experience points to the truth of what love is. It's not just about words. It says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every aspect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. So we become unified, become the exact thing Jesus prayed for when we begin to learn how to discern the lie. Peter, again, I want to go back to him. He says this, resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Man, we, we understand the bigger picture that's happening. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Why don't you bow your heads? And I just want you to just for a second here... Um, One, just made me think about how God's speaking to your heart. But two, what's maybe a lie you've been believing about yourself, about someone who disagrees with you? Maybe it's a grouping of people. Maybe it's a family member, whatever. Your own faith. God, this morning, I just want to pause here because um, what you want from us is transformation. What you want is to embody the truth of who you are and personally and communally. God, I pray that um, we will have a humble disposition to want to be um, curious about one another, to be committed to one another, to have courage to really center ourselves on you to be content with all this is because that's what humble people do. And in that humility, we, what starts to happen is we become a strong, steadfast, firm community centered on one name and that one name is you, Jesus. Everything hinges on that. And so... Um, God, today I just pray that we would want to learn to discern the lie, to ask ourselves, what are the lies that I'm believing about myself? What are the lies I'm believing about community? What are the lies I'm believing about others? But to be the kind of people that are seeing the good, that strive to have this level of love and commitment and grace and forgiveness to ourselves and to one another. But most importantly, God, is this decision that everyone has to make of whether or not to believe to surrender their lives to you, to make a decision to follow you, which every person in this room has the opportunity to make. The desire to follow you is not just about making a decision for today. The desire to follow you then becomes about, oh, I want to surrender my life and my thoughts and my actions and become a person of justice, become a person of love, become a person of kindness and grace and forgiveness. And my life centered on what? Jesus taught, motivated and transformed by the Spirit of God. We all have that choice. So God, we just give this to you and just pray that um, we will be here at Hill City, just a humble community that seeks to serve you in a passionate way. We love you and thank you. In your name we pray, everyone said, amen. Um, before you all get out of here, a couple quick things. Um, one, our partner uh, for the month is Extra Mile Pediatrics. If you want to learn about the work that they're doing all throughout the city, uh, I mean all throughout the world, uh, please go and talk to them. Uh, Easter is coming up really soon. Invite people. We are making space. We're making plans for more chairs and different things throughout the space. Invite as many people as you want and don't forget to register uh, for that. And thank you, um, you guys, so much for uh, your constant generosity and just making this thing happen uh, throughout this city. If you need prayer, they'll be up here. We'd love to meet you on your way out. Have a great rest of your Sunday and we'll see you next week.